How does grief fit into the polyvagal theory? The short answer is that it's kind of all over the place on the polyvagal ladder. My name's Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist that thinks the world needs a new understanding of mental health. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken. This podcast is not therapy, nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy, of course. This is a little clip from a recent Stuck Not Meetup that I did. A Stuck Not Meetup is basically where I meet up with my students, the students of my courses, like the Polyvagal Trauma Relief System. So we meet up at least once a month and I can uh, answer their questions, just give them clarity on whatever they need as far as questions from the courses or if they need further information uh, or just to clarify something, this is a chance for them to do so. And the, this person brought up uh, grief. I thought it was a fantastic question and I wanted to share it with all of you. Something did come up in my session today. I just, I wondered where, where grief fell on the polyvagal. Oh boy. Everywhere. All over the ladder. It's up and down the ladder. Honestly, there's a book called clinical applications of the polyvagal theory. Are you familiar with that one? Okay. It's a collection of essays from different, um, professions. So there's an essay from Deb Dana about therapy and the polyvagal theory, but there's also an essay from her about her husband in a hospital and all the danger cues in there. But there's also an essay in there about uh, like nursing, I think, maybe one on teaching, but it's all these different professions. And one person wrote about grief, and I forget her name, but it was a, it was a great, it's one of the ones that really stuck out to me. It's a fantastic article. The article, she lays out that grief is not just like you miss somebody, right? It, it's really like this fundamental um change in every aspect of your daily life, potentially, depending on circumstances, I suppose. But I remember she, she had so, written something in the article about like, expecting to say something to that person the next day and realizing they weren't there and feeling like flight fight kind of stuff. But maybe at the at the funeral, they were in this very deep shutdown, or maybe at first, it was more of a freeze shock reaction. So it's like it could be any of these things at any moment i don't think it's random but um it's kind of like it's all over the political ladder and especially depending on the context of how you lost somebody i think that's going to play into whether or not it's more in more of a freeze more of a shutdown um and i mean just to kind of keep it loose does that make sense like if you lose somebody through an unexpected uh attack you know what I mean? I don't know how, how graphic you guys want me to be. I don't know how, if I can untimely. use. Some, untimely. untimely. Yeah. yeah. And if it's like a brutal <laughs> kind of death, then there's probably going to be more of a, a shock freeze factor to that versus, you know, someone's going to pass away. You've had a chance to say goodbye and they pass away. And of, of course it's still going to affect that person, anybody. Right. But it may not be a freeze or may not be the same kind of freeze as all of a sudden someone's gone in a very brutal way. Um, so point being is grief is going to kind of be all over the political ladder. You're also going to probably have moments of deep appreciation, you know, the, of uh, not just like missing your sad, but also when I work with people in, in grief, going through grief, they'll, you know, obviously tell me about the painful stuff and, how much they miss them and things aren't the same and I'm still in shock and you know all that stuff. But as they share these things, they'll eventually naturally do this, the pendulation process of going to a safety anchor and it'll be like a memory, like, Oh, there was, there was this one time that they did fill in the blank. Right. And they'll sit with that for a little bit and they'll come back to uh, the pain and they'll come back to um, a safety anchor or a memory, or they'll remember a certain moment or a laugh or you know whatever so the, it's it's normal and it's to be kind of up and down the political ladder to be in safety but also to drop down and to really experience more of a maybe a shutdown anger at the fact that they're not here anymore so fight or even um anxiousness because like well what's life going to be like tomorrow and can i rely on people to be in my life the next day like there might be some anxiousness maybe even some panicky freeze flavor in there 
so to put to put it simply, yeah, you're kind of up and down. I think with grief, it's it's very common to be up and down the polyvagal ladder. It wasn't what I expected. What did you expect? I wasn't sure. Um, something along the line of a story following state, and mm. that state can be influenced by your attachment. Oh, yeah. Well, sure, sure, sure. But story follow state would be, uh, like, like, like I said before, where someone is going, you know, up and down the ladder and they're sharing with me, uh, their sadness, they're going to attach that their story is going to follow. So they will be in a shutdown state and feel some deep sadness and numbness maybe. And so their story is going to follow and the story might be, uh, how lonely they are and how life doesn't mean anything anymore. And they can't imagine their future. There's, there's no hope. There's no happiness. There's nothing. So that's, that's the story. The story is what's the point of living. Maybe the story is. I cannot continue without this person. So that's the story following the state. Whereas as they process and talk and go through the grieving process, eventually they'll get to a point where they're like, they have appreciation and for what they did get to experience. And so the story is going to be that one memory or that one hug or the overall theme of, I, I got to live with, I got to live with this person. I, I got to have them in their, in my life. And wow, am I lucky? That's a story following the state of safety. So that, that's how story follow state would, would come into play or what it could look like. It almost seems like um, state would follow a story in a way when you talk could. about memories. It could, it definitely could. I think it's tricky to, to, to discern that, but um in in some some memories uh, to me it's like if i bring it up like if i'm working with someone who's grieving and i so there's been moments where that person's just kind of like lost in their pain and so i will bring up a specific question of like hey when was the last time that you um hugged them or smile with them and and the point is i'm trying to trigger that the state through a story and so you know it, as long as it clicks they'll they, they might smile and say oh yeah there was that that one time where you know whatever so i'm giving them i'm prompting a story which then triggers the state so that totally could be true and the state actually might bring up a story like um, what's the point of living without this person and that story is going to reinforce the state so it's kind of like this it could be a um, a self perpetuating. Is that right? Self perpetuating, you know, loop of story follow state follow story follow state. So yeah, it it could be that. I think it's why in therapy it's so helpful to like say things out loud to get it out of that loop into somebody else's you know empathy and to receive co regulation and and then allow the loop to break. So basically, it's kind of like allow the similar image with that behavioral adaptation loop to get that to break and then to be able to go up the path, path A, or the grieving path. Did that help? It did. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah, there's a lot to grief. A lot to it. It's been, that's been coming up way more ever since COVID. That's come up a lot more in my therapy. Um, this past year or two, a lot of a lot of kids that I'm working with, teenagers that I'm working with that are grieving. And in, in the circumstances, it's with COVID, it's like unexpected. There's panic surrounding it and they're being blocked from, uh, or they were being blocked from seeing their family member and saying goodbye in person. You know, so there's all these just aspects of it that compound the issue. But that's a whole other discussion. Now, you may not be in one of my courses and maybe you're not able to purchase one of my courses right now. And that's okay. I have a ton of free stuff for you besides this podcast. I also have something I just started. It's called a uh, it's called the three day polyvagal states challenge, and this is where I send you one email per day for three days, and I give you a quick lesson on um, the state that you are supposed to identify that day, and then I teach you how to identify it in a safe way. And yeah, this even includes the defensive states of shutdown and freeze and flight fight as well. I found a way to teach about them and help you identify them each day in a way that should not be triggering and that should not suck you into the vortex of that defensive state. This, this should not be a traumatizing or re-traumatizing experience. 
Um, I think I did a really good job with making it approachable and understandable for the beginner or someone who's maybe just going back to the concepts and becoming curious all over again. So yeah, we even delve into the defensive states, but I promise I made it approachable. You might like it and it's for free. So head on over to justinlmft.com slash three day polyvagal and sign up for my email list and you'll get immediate uh, access to the first lesson for that day. And then you'll get a lesson the next two days as well. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening to this fellow stuck knot. I do hope that you got something out of this that will help you in your own process of getting unstuck. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you are experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.